If you're a software engineer, your yearly income is most likely in the six figures. Some of you may be at the top of that six figure range, while others may be towards the bottom. In either case, you probably make a very good income. But believe it or not, even with a very high income, you can end up living paycheck to paycheck. I've seen it happen too many times. So in this video, I will give you a list of simple investments that you can make that will make you a multimillionaire before you retire. But even more importantly, they will build up your risk tolerance and move you towards achieving financial freedom where working a nine to five job is a choice and not a requirement. All right, let's get straight to it. Hi folks, my name is Utsav. I'm a software engineer based in Seattle. I have about 20 years of experience in the industry where I've held diverse engineering roles and created a few tech startups as well. And I'm currently at Microsoft. If you're new to this channel, my goal here is to help you get the best out of your career by mentoring you around five key pillars, technical skills, engineering efficiency, mindset, entrepreneurship, and financial freedom. So if that sounds interesting, please consider subscribing and follow me at Engineering with Utsav for behind the scenes and monthly Q and A's. The first step in securing your financial outlook is doing the basics right. You don't become financially secure by standing on a foundation that is not set up correctly. So as the very basics of personal finance, you will not only need to make sure that you have a solid safety net, but also ensure that you're lowering your tax bill as much as possible and you're also grabbing every free dollar that you can get your hands on. So the first thing to do is create an emergency fund. There is no point investing on anything else until you protect your family and yourself from unforeseen events. Look, shit happens in life and unexpected costs pop up every now and then. And the difference between going from being a baller to being bankrupt is a well-funded emergency account. With the recession potentially looming and tech layoffs becoming commonplace, this is even more important now more so than ever. So here's what I want you to do. Start by tracking your monthly fixed expenses, your mortgage, car payments, utility bills, groceries, etc. This is the amount you'll need each month to continue living the way you currently are. At a bare minimum, your emergency fund should have three times this, which will give you a three month runway. But if you ask me, this is too short. You should aim for at least six to 12 months and ideally one to two years worth of emergency funds. Personally, I prefer this to be liquid cash. Some folks like to put theirs in CDs, which give a decent interest back. But if you ever need to take your money out, you'll need to pay penalties. And given the fact that high yield savings accounts these days are giving great interest rates, um, I suggest going with that instead. Banks like Ally, American Express, SoFi, and CIT all offer high yield saving accounts that offer four to five percent interest rates. Once your emergency fund is set up and running, the next step is to reduce your taxable income and get free money by contributing to your 401k. Most companies offer to match a certain percentage of your contribution. For now, just contribute only up to whatever your employer matches. We'll come back to investing more at a later step. It's important to ensure that you get the maximum match because that is is essentially free money. How much that match is varies by the company, so check with your employer. But let's look at a couple of examples. Let's say that your company matches 50% of your contribution and up to 6% of your annual salary. So if you make $100,000 a year, what this means is that if you contribute $6,000 to your 401k, your company will contribute $3,000 extra. Some other companies may choose to match a percentage of your contribution all the way to the maximum allowed by the IRS. For 2024, that maximum amount is $23,000. So in such a case, if your company matches 50% and you contribute 23,000 to your 401k, your company will contribute an additional 11,500. That is literally free money and no one should be losing out on free money. And not to mention your 401k contribution up to $23,000 is pre-tax, which means it lowers the amount of tax you'll pay on your income. So check with your company to see what they match and contribute at least the amount needed to get a full match. Once you have taken care of your 401k match, you want to look into your company's Employee Stock Purchase Program, or ESPP, which is basically a program offered by a company that allows its employees to purchase company stocks at a discounted price. This discount is typically 10 to 15%. And just like the 401k match, a 15% discount on the company stocks is literally free money. And as I said before, no one should be losing on free money. Also, generally, there is no restriction on when you can sell these stocks. So if you don't want to hold on to your company stocks, you could buy at the discounted rate and then immediately sell those stocks to reinvest in a more diversified manner. And this is generally a good strategy since you probably also get company stocks as part of your overall compensation. So you don't want to take on the additional risk by over investing on one single stock. One note though that 
selling right away versus after a year could have different tax implications with regards to short-term versus long-term capital gains. But regardless of whether you decide to sell it off right away or not, you should take advantage of your ESPP. The next thing to do is to max out your health savings account. If you have health issues or a large family and need to have traditional health insurance plan, you can skip this section as this does not apply to you. But if you're relatively young and you and your family are healthy, you should consider opting for a high deductible healthcare plan or HDHP. As the name suggests, HDHP has a higher deductible compared to traditional health insurance plans, but also comes with lower premiums and more importantly, from a financial perspective, health savings account or an HSA. The HSA is a tax advantaged savings account where you can contribute pre-tax dollars that you can use for qualified medical expenses. It is commonly known in the financial world that the HSA is a triple tax advantaged account. So if you look at the 401k, you can contribute tax free, but you'll have to pay taxes when you withdraw. A Roth IRA is the opposite where you pay taxes when you contribute, but the growth and the withdrawal are tax free. But with the HSA, your contribution is pre-tax. And if you use it for medical expenses, the withdrawal is also not tax, which means your contribution, growth and withdrawal of your money in your HSA account is essentially tax free. And to add to that, your employer will also contribute a fixed amount to your HSA for free. And let me tell you, one more time, no one should be losing out on free money. So it'd be foolish not to take advantage of this investment option. The contribution limits for an HSA account for 2024 is 4,150 if you're just by yourself and 8,300 for a family plan. Definitely make sure to max out your HSA. Okay, at this point, you've taken care of the basics. The next step is moving towards financial security. Having financial security means having enough money to fund your lifestyle, absorb financial shocks, and set yourself up for greater financial goals whether that is to earn more or be free from the traditional sense of a nine to five job. The exact idea will vary by person, but the gist here is to feel comfortable and confident about your current and future financial situation. So let's look at this step that will help us get there. Okay, so you can't really feel secure and confident about your financial outlook if you're paying high interests on your debt. So the first thing I encourage you to do is pay those off. There's really no point investing on something else, trying to earn 12% return if you're paying 26% interest on your credit cards, right? And not to mention most high interest debt also tends to be for highly depreciating assets. So that's a double whammy against your potential to earn more money. It baffles me how this is not common sense, but you cannot be driving around in a $100,000 sports car paying 8% interest on a 72 month loan if you only make $150,000 a year. Ask any financially savvy person and they will tell you that the number one wealth killer is luxury good, like expensive cars or high fashion items, especially when they are beyond what you can afford. Look, I'm not suggesting that you live like a hermit. It's okay to get a few nice things that you really care about. I personally love cars too. But if you want nicer things, you need to one, be smart about it. And second, deprioritize them towards the end of the list. So I will get to the fancy toy part at the end of the list. But for now, if you have anything that has high interest, work towards paying it down right away. If that means that you have to sell your dream car to make it happen, do it because you have pulled the trigger on your car too early. There are many other items in this list that you need to sort out before you get to your dream car. But I promise you, you can get it later and you'll thank me for it. I would normally say that anything over three to 4% is high interest and needs to be paid down. But 2024 is a weird duck and home mortgages right now are upwards of 7%. So here's what I suggest you do. Pay your debt down in the following order. Credit cards first, followed by personal loans, student loans, and auto loans. Skip mortgage for now even if your interest rate is high. We will get back to that at a later step. Also, if you have different kinds of debt and aren't really sure about the right order or distribution of your payments, look up either the snowball method or the avalanche method. The snowball method attacks the smallest debt first, regardless of the interest rate, and builds up momentum towards the larger ones, just like a snowball would. Paying off smaller debts is easier and seeing them paid off gives you motivation, especially if you struggle with it. The avalanche method, on the other hand, attacks the highest interest debt first, regardless of the size of the debt, and has the potential to save you more on the long run. Either one is fine, just use the one that you like. I will put links to both methods in the description below if you're interested in reading. Okay, once your high interest debt is trending down towards zero, the next major step in building financial security is to revisit your 401k and max it up. When we visited the 401k earlier in the video, I mentioned that there are some companies that match a percentage of the maximum contribution allowed by the IRS. If that's your company, then you would have already maxed out your contribution to your 401k in order to receive 
receive the full match from your employer. If that's you, you can skip this step and move on to the next one. But if your company's match tops out before you reach the maximum contribution allowed by IRS, then you should contribute the remaining amount now so that you max out your 401k. Once again, the contribution limit for 2024 is 23,000 if you're younger than 50 and 30,500 if you're 50 years or older. Since this contribution is still pre-tax, it will help you save money by lowering your taxable income. Okay, you're making excellent progress towards making your financial security rock solid. The next step is to take advantage of the backdoor Roth IRA. Roth IRAs are almost the exact opposite of 401ks where you pay taxes upfront for your contribution, where the money grows tax-free and you can withdraw it tax-free. As a software engineer, you will most likely be at a higher tax bracket when you withdraw money from your retirement accounts. So a Roth IRA makes a lot of sense due to its tax-free withdrawals. The only downside here is that there is a salary cap for eligibility. For 2024, if you're filing taxes as single and make more than $161,000 a year, or if you're filing jointly and make more than $240,000 a year, you are not eligible to contribute to the Roth IRA. And this is where the backdoor comes into play. A backdoor Roth IRA is a strategy where high income earners who exceed Roth IRA income limits can still convert their traditional IRA to the Roth IRA. So check with your employer if they allow you to convert your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, and if they do, definitely max it up. The maximum contribution limit to the Roth IRA in 2024, I believe, is $8,000. Okay, so now that you've taken care of the backdoor Roth, it's time for the mega backdoor. Seriously, I'm not even making this up. It's real. If your 401k is maxed out and you've also maxed out your Roth conversions, most likely through the backdoor strategy, then the mega backdoor strategy allows you to contribute even more to your Roth IRA as after-tax dollars. To execute this strategy, you'll take advantage of the after-tax contributions, which is still part of your 401k, but is not subjected to the 23 thousand dollar 401k limit. In fact, you can contribute an additional $46,000 of after-tax dollars to your 401k for 2024 for a total of $69,000. Now, not all companies allow after-tax rollovers to Roth IRA, so check with your company first. But if they do allow it, you can now roll over that after-tax contribution to your Roth IRA. Why would anyone do that? Well, if you let your after-tax dollars sit on your traditional 401k, you would be taxed on it when you withdraw it eventually. So that would mean that you would end up paying taxes twice, when you contribute and when you withdraw. But if you roll it over to a Roth IRA, it can now grow tax-free and you won't be taxed during the withdrawal. Once again, your company's 401k must allow after-tax conversions and an in-plan distribution to a Roth IRA for this to work. But I know that most big tech companies do allow that. So if you're eligible, this is a great way to put a lot of income into your tax advantage account where the money can grow and compound tax-free. With that said, on to the next step for financial security, and that is a 529 education savings plan. Even if you don't have kids right now, if you do plan on having kids someday, you should think about investing on a 529 plan. The 529 plan is basically like the first cousin of the Roth IRA, in that your contributions are after tax, but the money grows tax-free and you don't pay taxes on withdrawal as long as the money is being used for educational expenses from kindergarten all the way to grad school. If you start putting your money into a 401k very young, and let's say that you've paid off your children's school years down the line and still have money left in your 529, you can roll up to $35,000 of leftover money into your Roth IRA as long as the funds have been in your 529 for over 15 years. Either way, 529 is something you should consider regardless, uh, not just to help your children out, but as part of your own financial security because should your children not get good scholarships, the burden to pay their education will fall on you, which will obviously make a dent in your overall financial outlook. Okay, so you started off by doing the very basics of finance, starting an emergency fund, minimizing your tax bill, and maximizing the free money that you you can get. The next steps after that were aimed at building financial security where you ensured that you can maintain a certain lifestyle, absorb any shocks and have your retirement sorted out. The next set of steps now will move you towards building a solid foundation for achieving financial independence where you will eventually have enough money to live the life you want with or without the income from a job. The first step towards financial independence is to make sure you treat your individual investments through taxable brokerage accounts separately from your retirement investments. Investments. I personally don't even factor in my 401k, Roth IRA, and my HSA into my net worth. For me, that number comes from my personal investments and assets that aren't for my retirement. There are a lot of nuances to investing in the stock market, especially if you consider all the approaches and strategies of building an ideal portfolio. But I will tell you one thing, 
even if you just invest on index funds, you will be far better than not investing at all. In fact, some very wealthy and successful people will tell you that investing on a broad index fund is actually the better way to invest. The average annual return for the S&P since its inception in 1928 is 9.9% and the average return since adopting the 500 stocks into the index in 1957 is 10.26%. So even if you do nothing but invest all your money into an index fund that reflects the S&P 500, you will be doing leaps and bounds better than most people in the US. To put that into perspective, let's say you started investing at a pretty late age of 35 with an initial capital of $25,000 and put everything on the S&P 500 index fund. After that, you continue to put $2,000 every month into that account. By the time you retire at the age of 60, you will have $2.7 million just on this account. That is the power of compounding. So the only correct time to start investing if you haven't already is now. And look, maybe $2,000 a month is too high for you and that's okay. Aim to put at least 5% of your income every month into your investment account and try to stretch that number all the way to 20% if possible. Invest small amounts and invest regularly. Don't try to time the market and guess when to buy and sell. Even professionals don't get that right. Keep it simple, invest frequently and hold for the long run. This is called dollar cost averaging, which is a strategy to manage price risk when you're buying stocks, ETFs or mutual funds. Instead of purchasing stocks at a single price point, um, you buy in smaller amounts at regular intervals regardless of the price. On the long run, this is a better and a safer option than taking huge risks on trying to time or, or guess the market. Okay, so remember how this video started with the emergency fund? Well, it's time to revisit that. Only now, it's not for emergencies, but for flexible investing. See, while it's never a good idea to try to time the market, there are certain situations that make up for great investment opportunities. This is where having some additional flexible liquid cash can add hundreds and thousands of dollars, if not millions, to your net worth. Major market crashes, global economic downturns, or recessions are great examples of such opportunities. To quote Warren Buffett, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Since you have have taken all the necessary steps to ensure that you're financially secure and have the liquid cash, you can snap up a ton of stocks for cheap in these situations where others are scrambling to sell because their risk tolerance is much lower than yours. A recent example of such an opportunity is when the stock market plummeted at the start of the pandemic in March 2020. If you had simply put $30,000 into an index fund ETF like Vanguard's VOO at that time, you would have almost $70,000 today. That's a $40,000 return just by taking advantage of cheap stocks. But let me re-emphasize that you need to understand the difference between a large-scale event that crashes the market versus trying to buy and sell at every dip and rise. You're not trying to do analytical trading or buy individual stocks. You're instead buying broad index funds when the market crashes and holding on to them for a long time. And having flexible liquid cash lying around is a great way to take advantage of such events. Since I promised at the beginning of the video that I would talk about fancy toys, I'm going to add a short section over here. Look, Everyone knows that most fancy toys are bad financial moves. But if you have done all of these steps above, you've already achieved a high degree of financial independence. So before taking the final step, if you want to splurge a little, go for it. You have earned it and you deserve it. But there's always a but. Even when you go for your fancy toys, you can be smart about it. So you preferably earn money out of it or break even or at the very least minimize your losses. Now, I cannot give you precise advice here on what to follow because I don't know what fancy thing you're into. But let me just give you an example of splurging in a smart way. Let's say you want to buy a car. The conventional wisdom suggests that you should go buy something sensible that will take you from point A to point B. So let's say that the more sensible splurging option is to get a Hyundai Ioniq 5, which would have cost you around $55,000 back in 2022. Most people would respect the choice. It's a great looking car. It is an EV, reliable, and it mostly flies under the radar. Seems like a decent financial choice. Now let's look at a more controversial option from a non-car person's perspective, which is probably getting a fancy sports car. Let's say a Porsche 911. Uh, base 911 would have cost you around $120,000 in 2022 and would have definitely raised a lot more eyebrows when it comes to your decision to splurge $120,000 on a massively depreciating asset like a sports car. But obviously, it isn't what it seems from the outside. If you look at the depreciation curve of the Ionic 5, it went from $55,000 in 2022 to $35,000 in 2024. But if you look at the more controversial choice, that $120,000 911 went up in value to 
225,000 in 2024. So essentially the Ionic would have cost you about $830 a month to drive for two years, whereas the 911 would have earned you $200 a month for driving it. My point here is that if you're smart about it, even when you splurge, you can still come out on top. Just make sure you have earned it and have prioritized all of the other steps from this video before you get to your fancy toys. I know I mostly focused on the stock market in this video. That's because I think that is something all of us should have as part of our investment portfolio. And that is where I would encourage everyone to start. But there are many other investment options if you have reached this point and still have more income to invest. Not to mention your stock portfolio itself will continue to grow and return dividends, which you can use to diversify to other investment categories, things like real estate, angel investments, your own business, or even your personal growth. Um, what exactly those investments are depends on your interests and your skill set. The steps that I mentioned so far in this video really are the core of personal finance, where you start with financial security and build up to financial independence. How you grow from here and how you reach the ultimate goal of achieving total financial freedom is up to you. Maybe you pay down even your low interest debt like your mortgage to become debt free. Maybe you earn enough from your portfolio that you don't even need to work anymore. Or maybe you invest on your own business and take that to the next level. Or maybe you go for a dividend yielding portfolio and live off that the sky is the limit. But even if you stop at this point and settle for what you have, you're already in a better shape than 99% of people. So if you've made it this far in life, you should be proud of yourself. Congratulations. But also remember, even if you're far behind, don't get discouraged. As I mentioned earlier, the best time to start securing your financial future is now. Every day you delay this process, you're losing out on the magic of compound growth. If you're unsure and have questions, feel free to shoot me a message on Instagram at Engineering with Utsav. I won't be able to give you legal financial advice, but I can definitely give you some tips and direct you to some useful resources. Also, this is where I encourage you to watch a related software engineering video. But since this is a very finance heavy video, I guess you can check this other video out where I share the lessons I learned from creating a multi-million dollar tech startup. And please like the video if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing for more content aimed at helping you holistically build a software engineering career. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.